Praise the Lord, Church. Well, tonight we're going to be starting a new. Uh, well, it's not really. We're going to keep a uh, follow up from what we started last month. Last month we we're looking at the believer's inheritance, and this month we're going to go into the practical applications concerning that. Amen. We looked at certain things last month, and they're part of the inheritance. But I'm going to go into. I'm going to kind of approach it from a different, a different direction this month. Amen. Look at Second Peter chapter one. Let's bow heads in prayer. I'm going to turn Second Peter chapter one. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight and we give you all the praise. We just exalt you, Father. We appreciate you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you, Father, for counting us uh, worthy because of the blood of Jesus to stand in your presence without a sense of inferiority, without a sense of, 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 uh, of doubt, of sin, and just being righteous. You are righteous because of the blood. Thank you, Father. And also you said that it is given unto us to know the things of the kingdom, the mysteries of the kingdom. Therefore, Father, we thank you right now because the Holy Spirit is our teacher. And Lord, I submit myself to you to think through me, speak through me, express yourself fully through me, oh God, all of you, none of me. And Lord, let your people be blessed because their ears are anointed, their hearts are anointed to receive your word, ears are anointed to hear, eyes are anointed to see your word tonight. And therefore, Lord, it is going to be a wonderful time because you'll be teaching us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, I'm going to start from verse, I could start from verse 1, but I don't want to really go to, uh, I don't want to go there right now, because that would take me off on a different journey. But Second Peter chapter 1 from verse 3, it says that according, we're talking about the believer's inheritance, we're going to approach it from a different way today, I'm going to be talking about healing and health, healing and health. Second Peter 1 verse 3, it says, according as his divine power, has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to glory and virtue. I read it again. But let me take it with the accordingness because that way, you know, if we if that's the accordingness, we have to look at verse 2. I don't want to read verse 2, so I'll kind of put the accordingness in brackets. We can I read from his divine power. Okay? His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto, unto life and godliness. His divine powers, okay, I can't escape verse two, let's go to verse two. It says grace and peace are multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace and peace, the Bible says it gets multiplied, it says through knowledge. Through knowledge, grace and peace gets multiplied by to you, or to us rather. And grace and peace increases in measure in our lives through knowledge. Okay, what does that mean? If you don't have revelation concerning, you know, the things that God is speaking about here, you will not experience grace and peace. You need revelation knowledge. You need God to open the eyes of understanding for you to actually be able to have grace and peace multiplied or be increased in their manifestations in your life. Okay, grace and peace, the Bible does not say it's multiplied to you by crying. It's not multiplied to you by shouting and jumping. The Bible says it's multiplied to you through what? Knowledge. Through knowledge. So there's that important. It's important that we gain knowledge, revelation knowledge, so that we can begin to walk in increasing measures of grace and peace. Of course, we read before in Hosea where it says, My people perish for lack of knowledge. Okay, but we are not one of those people. Jesus said it's given unto us to know what the mysteries of the kingdom are. Therefore, we can have grace and peace multiplied to us. Because we have a right to know the mystery of the kingdom, and the Holy Spirit is our teacher. Okay, it says of our Lord Jesus, of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power, according as His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and goodness. Who divine power? Jesus our Lord. Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who has called us to glory and virtue. Now the word knowledge, the second part there, if you look at look at the second part of verse 3, the knowledge there speaks about relational knowledge. Knowledge in verse 2 speaks about revelation knowledge, which speaks about you know what God reveals to you, and as God reveals them to you, you are growing and walking in peace and grace, or grace and peace rather. Now in verse 3, the knowledge talking about there is relational knowledge. What does that mean? That is my brother. I have, he's my brother, I know him. That's relational knowledge, okay? That means I have a relationship with that person, therefore I know that person, okay? But the, the verse 2 speaks about an increase in revelation knowledge that brings you grace and peace. 
which is basically tied to the Word of God. Verse 2 is saying, the more revelation of the Word of God that I have, okay, the more I can walk in grace and peace. Verse 3 speaks about a settled fact. Settled fact, relational knowledge. You are in Christ. Therefore, you are God's child. God knows you. And you know him as your father. Relational knowledge. The Bible says, then look at verse 3 again. According as his divine power has given unto us, he's given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him. More or less, when you got born again, God gave you everything you need. The Bible says, things that pertain unto life and godliness, unto natural life, unto your daily living and godly living. Which means that God has, through our relationship with him, taken care of all, because of our relationship with him, God has taken care of everything that has to do our natural life, our day-to-day -day life, and also our spiritual life. Amen. Hallelujah. To the package. That means that when you got born again, your born again experience is not only secure your heaven, it's secure your earthly life. That's what it's saying here. Because oftentimes we say when you know when you get born again, we're supposed to go, oh heaven is now my home and I have eternal life. I've told you before, eternal life is not about longevity of days, it's not about length of days, it's about the quality of life. Okay, but God says here in this scripture that because of, your, of my and your relationship with Jesus, everything that we have is taken care of, or that we need, so it's taken care of. According as his divine power, or let me use the word, let me put it bracket, according as his divine power has given unto us all things, all things that pertain to life and godliness. That means in all things, so it's about everything you ever and I would ever need for life. What do I need? Think about everything you need. Think about need for a family. Think about need for finances, for health, for joy, for peace. Think about need for academics. Think about need for a job. Think about need for promotion. Think about need for grandchildren. Think about just anything you need. It's all included there. It's all included there because you know him. Okay, because you have a relationship with him. Because this is part of your inheritance package. That's what I'm talking about. It's part of what you have in Christ. Everything that you need in life. Is provided for. Okay? Then it says, uh, I got third knowledge of him who has called us to glory and virtue. Hold your place in 2 Peter 1. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Hold your place in 2 Peter chapter 1. My notes are not relevant right now. I'm just filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Amen. I was going to go about it in front way for my notes, but God is taking it this way, and amen is still on track. Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. It says that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath or who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay? Okay, let me, let me try, let me try and change. I'm not changing the word. I'm just gonna say it in a way that we'll, we'll be able to understand a little bit better. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all blessings, but, I put in brackets, but they are in the Spirit, in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus, all because of Jesus. All the blessings that we have are stored in heavenly places because of Jesus. He has blessed us with everything that we need, but it's in a bank called the bank of heaven. That's what I'm saying. And that bank of heaven is a spiritual bank. Okay? Now, someone said, why is a spiritual bank? Think about it. God is a spirit. The Bible says in John 4, 24. Okay? If God, who is a spirit, made all things natural, that means that the spirit must be the real deal. If God, who is spirit, made all things natural, therefore, the fact that your blessings or my blessings, which we have in Christ, are in the spirit, means they are the real deal. Do you understand what I'm saying? Of the fact that the blessing that we have, the Bible says here, it calls them spiritual blessings. But the word is, I'll say, blessings that are in the realm of the spirit and, and secured in heavenly places. Why did it say heavenly places? Why did it kind of put spiritual in the heavenly places? Because there's also the devil. The devil is under spiritual realm, as it were. There's the demonic realm, which is also quote unquote spiritual. When I say spiritual, in the sense of you cannot see it. That's what I mean. Okay, so it tells you which we're talking about here. Uh, blessings which are in the spirit secured in heaven in Christ Jesus. Amen. Therefore, everything that we need, that's what it's saying here towards verse 3, is provided 
four. Now pause there for a minute. Let's pull the brakes a little bit. Go back to who has blessed us. Verse three. Now I've said this, and I'm going to say it for the purpose of those who have not heard it before. I've said this, and that is this: that when Adam and Eve sinned against God in Genesis chapter chapter three, we see that when the fall of, of man, you know, Adam and Eve, and all that, the Bible speaks about curses were released. Okay, cursed were you, cursed will you be, cursed, and all that. So the curse was the result of Adam's fall. The curse came on humanity, on all human beings, because of the fall of Adam. So in verse 3 here, it's turning out, God has blessed us. The word blessing here, therefore, is the antithesis to the curse. What am I saying? The blessing, speaking about here, cancels out the curse. The blessing, speaking here in verse 3, cancels out every curse. Let me say it another way. Every blessing that we have in Christ, or all that God has given us, is the cancellation to every curse that we got in Adam. Now, because of our relationship with Adam, we were cursed. Okay? Because of our relationship with Christ, the blessings of God, the Bible says, make it rich and add it no sorrow. It cancels out every sorrow. That's what I'm saying. God's blessings upon your life and upon my life because of Jesus is the answer and the antidote and the antithesis to every curse that came upon humanity because of Adam's sin. So now, because of our relationship with Christ Jesus, we are no longer cursed. We are blessed. We are not under any curse anymore. We are under and we live in the land of blessing. Look at it again. Blessed be the God and Father of all praise. I know, I know we say praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us or canceled out every curse. Cancel out every curse that is against you and I. Cancel them out. Cancel them out. Cancel them out. All canceled out. In fact, let's, let me show you another one again. Look, look at look at uh, uh, look look at Colossians chapter one. Colossians one. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory, 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 glory. Colossians chapter one. I'm going to start from verse ten. Uh, let me let me just go straight to right, verse twelve. Colossians 1 verse 12. It says, Give thanks unto the Father who has made us meet or able to partake as of the inheritance of the saints in light. So the Father has made us able, has made us able partakers. He has made you and I able to partake. Once you are born again, you are an able partaker. You have your part. The word partaker is two words, part and taker. That means you have you are you are worthy, you are able to take your part. The Bible says of the inheritance of the saints in the light. That means it's an inheritance from the saints in the light. We're no longer in darkness, look at the next verse. Who has delivered us out of the power of darkness? So he says, says the saints are in the light. So we uh, and it says that we have been delivered from the power of darkness or from the curse. We've been delivered. That means we've been completely taken away from the curse. We are no longer under any curse. There is no generational curse against you. Hallelujah. Once you got born again, every curse that was against you because of your identification with the cross, with Jesus, every cross, curse that was against you was immediately abolished, cancelled, and dissipated and destroyed completely. You're not under any curse anymore. You are blessed. The Bible says that. God has blessed you. God has blessed me. God has blessed you. That means he has canceled every curse. He has canceled every curse. He has canceled every curse. And it's time for us to be able to identify with the fact that we are blessed, not cursed. It's time for us to be able to fully identify with the fact that I'm blessed. Hallelujah. I'm delivered from every generational curse. And not because somebody prayed for me or not every oil. I'm not against those things, of course not. But because of my identity with Jesus, because I'm now living by grace, I'm living in this kingdom of God, I'm a child of God. Therefore, every curse is cancelled. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Okay, look what it says there. Verse 13. Deliver us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son or the kingdom of light because the saints are in the light. We are now in the kingdom of the son who beloves. We are in the kingdom of his dear son. Now, look, 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 let's, let's, let me try and answer a question here. If some who say, oh, there's generational curses against the believer, then the question is, if there is, then 
Jesus himself is cursed because he tells you, look at it here, you can have us one verse 13, he has translated us into, into, he has taken us out of, it's not just, it's not just the end, and put us into, we are now into, we are settled, we are settled in the kingdom of his dear son. So if Jesus, if I have a generational curse on my life, I'm now in the kingdom of his dear son, then Jesus has one too. <laughs> but Jesus has no curse. Okay, look, look, look at uh, wait, wait, Colossians, look at chapter 3, Colossians 3, look at verse 1. Look at verse 1. Colossians 3, look at verse 1. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It says that if you then be risen with Christ, risen together with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ seated at the right of the Father. So if I'm risen with Christ, okay, and Christ is now sitting around with the Father, where am I sitting? At the right of the Father. Okay, if I'm sitting with Christ, okay, and if I rose with Christ, I'm now stay with Him. What am I supposed to? I mean, what, what am I supposed to be? To be? Uh, how am I supposed to see myself sitting with Christ? The next verse: Set your affections, your desires, your your desires, your intentions, your appetites, and all that. It says on things above, not things on the earth. Why? Because I'm, that's who I am. I'm no longer in darkness. I'm no longer cursed. I'm now totally blessed. Everything that belongs to the Father belongs to me. Jesus said that in John 14 and John 16. He said over and over again, all that the Father has are mine. Holy Spirit will take them and show them to you. We saw in Romans chapter 8, when we began the study, we saw in Romans 8 telling that we are not just heirs of God. We are joint heirs with Christ. We're not just heirs of God, we're joined as a Christ. We have the same spirit of God as Jesus had. We are he is, uh, uh, we, we, we are children of God. Not just children, but heirs. Not just heirs, but joined as with Christ. That means that what belongs to the Father belongs to me. What belongs to Jesus belongs to me and belongs to the Father. Hallelujah. It's our inheritance. Total package. Go back to 2 Peter chapter 1. Go back there. 2 Peter chapter 1. It said, go back to 2 Peter 1 because the point I want to understand this. So, verse 3 of 2 Peter 1 establishes our position, establishes a fact, a forever fact. We are blessed. Ephesians 1 3. Ephesians 2 Peter 1 3 tells us it is done already because of my identification with Jesus, because of my relationship with Jesus. Okay, everything that pertains unto life and godliness is mine already. It's mine already. Okay, look at verse 4. Whereby are given unto us. This great, this given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these or with them or through them we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What's it saying? Let me break it down. What it's saying simply is this that in the light of this fact, in the light of this truth, this settled fact that you've been blessed with everything you need in life, okay? In the light of it, God gave us something which are called precious promises so that by them, so that with those keys, okay, we can begin to enjoy what belongs to us. That's what it said. Let me give you a good example, practical example. Let's just might tell somebody, this building belongs to you. Brand new building, or this car belongs to you. What will the person say to me next? Can I have the keys, please? <laughs> because if they don't have the keys, the car is theirs, but it's not really theirs. I mean, it's theirs as a fact. I can only show them the paper saying that it's your name. I show them the detail the house belongs to you. But as long as you don't have the keys to the house, you cannot enjoy that house. That's what I'm saying to you. As long as you don't have the keys to the house, or if you have the wrong keys to the house, you can't get in. <laughs> and if you're not careful, the cops might catch you trying to open a door that's not belonging to you. <laughs> so also it is in the spirit. The same way. The Bible says here, in the light of verse 3, a certain fact, God gives us exceeding great and precious promises or his word there. Uh, Okay, his word, so that by the word we can begin to enjoy this divine nature, this same things that belong to God. If you look at it, let me look at it again. It partakers of the divine nature, of the divine nature, or of what God has, of who God is, of what God can do. God gives us these keys, God gives us this word, He gives us these promises, so that with the promises we can begin to enjoy the things that belong to us. With the promise we can begin to lock out some things and open some other doors. Look at Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. With, those, with the promises, we can begin to enjoy, we can begin to unlock the certain things that, that are not part of this 
for this package and therefore with, with the promises in our hands or the promises in our hearts, with us knowing the word, we can begin to, you know, unlock and begin to enjoy what belongs.